Welcome to the First Things First podcast. And first things first, we need you to subscribe and leave comments, letting us know what you think of the show. We're listening. I'm Nick Wright, joined by two of my favorite people, Jenna Wolf, Chris Carter. Now let's get the show started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter, who's going for two touchdowns today. Oh, I'm going Three? to. Uh, I'm, I'm making it happen today. Okay. I'm feeling so much better than yesterday. Yes. And you were also, yesterday's show was great, but CeCe was working on, you had been up for. All the hours. I'd say 33 of the previous 35 hours, so not yep. a lot of sleep going. So ready. Ready. Okay, Let's do it. this is Nick Wright. What yeah. about you, two to three touchdowns today? No, 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 right no. now this is a day where I'm going to draw coverage, okay. get my man open, mm. maybe late in the game, have, throw a key block, score a touchdown late, but I'm not not worried about my stats, worried about the team getting the win. Oh, that's very nice. I myself that's am in a dime package, so I'm going to drop back and just hold off and wait You're playing defense for us. I got yeah. it. There you go. That's what I'm doing Jenna's today. Jenna's our, let you our shine. star strong safety, Jenna Wolf. Listen, anybody else lumber. giving Jenna more information, I'm I'm gonna slap her. I know, can't take She's anymore. overloaded. Yeah. She's, it's too much. I'm, I'm over- dropping down. I did a hissy. <laughs> All right, let's kick this off. You have to believe that Nick Foles woke up yesterday and immediately checked his phone. You know, just to make sure Sunday wasn't a dream. Okay, Eagles 41, Patriots 33. Yep, he won all right. So what do you do on Monday when you win MVP honors on Super Bowl Sunday? You go to that place, Disney World. Yeah, man. Then after that, you enjoy it. You go up, you go down, you whirl around, and then you get asked about your future. Customary if you've been the backup all season. However, Foles says for now he's not concerned with his future. I'm not really worried about my future right now. You know, I'm grateful to be a part of the Philadelphia Eagles. Said when I signed with the Eagles, you know, I'm grateful and content in this moment. Um, I'm staying in the moment. I'm not worried about my future right now. There'll be a time and a place to handle all that. But I, I take a lot of pride in wearing the Philadelphia Eagles jersey. And I just enjoy being here. It's such a great team. I'm excited for Carson Wentz coming back healthy. I get to work with him every day due to stud. And, uh, you know, I'm just living in the moment, I'm not thinking ahead. So a little insight, we have a 4 a.m. meeting every day. Everyone's a little, you know, a little kind of out of it. We just bump a couple topics around. And the term quarterback controversy came up with the Eagles. And uh, and everybody had a nice little chuckle over it because we are less than 48 hours from the Super Bowl ending, and we are talking about an Eagles quarterback controversy, if you will. CC, I will start with you. How do you think the Eagles should handle their quarterback situation? Yeah, it's just definitely a situation. It's not a controversy. No, not yet. All right, and... Uh, you, you, a lot of times when you have a controversy, it's based on expectations of the second guy. You know, if the franchise has named the starter, for the most part, all teams, if they could, they like to, for the team to know, for the organization to know, who's going to be that starter. Every team can't have a franchise quarterback, but every team's got to name a starter and be decisive about that because it helps him every day be able to lead the team. Philadelphia has a great situation. Not only as far as their quarterback, look at all the other players that they've been on. Their linebackers. They lost Jordan Hicks, their middle linebacker. <clears throat> they had other players to step in. Right. The reason why their season wasn't ruined was because the investment that they made, $12 million over two years, I, it would be a different conversation if he had signed a one-year deal. He was a hired gun to come in there. But his job doesn't change. When they hired him, they told him, Nick, we believe you can play. All right? If our starter gets hurt, We believe that you're more than competent to be a starter in this league. We want to have you here. You're familiar with Philadelphia. You're familiar with the personnel. Stay here in Philadelphia for two years. Mentor Carson Wentz. You heard him say, man, Carson Wentz is a stud. So in his mind, based on what the team told him, how he looks at Carson Wentz, like when you know the guy in front of you is so much better, you come to work with a better frame of mind. You better come than to- you if you know the guy in front of you so much better than you are, you mean? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Like, he, he said, man, this guy's a stud. They know through the, the um, trading the draft picks the way they selected him. He was on his way to MVP this year. So Nick Foles knows better than and maybe everyone but, you know, Doug Peterson, um, you know, how Carson Wentz is. But let's just look at this. What about the teams this year who didn't have a backup? And lost, their, their whole season was lost. Um, Colts, Andrew Luck. Mm-hmm. Theirs was so bad, they had to trade a draft pick for Jacoby Brissett from New England. 
Deshaun Watson, one of the bright stars. Man, he had a month like no one has ever seen. Season ruined. Packers, Aaron Rodgers. That's the most notable one because I mean, they didn't even – Luck and Watson, CC, done for the year. Like, the Packers just needed someone to hold the fort for six, seven right. weeks, and they could have been right. okay. And look what happened in Arizona. Mm -hmm. So bad there. Carson Palmer's done. When mm -hmm. he got hurt, he's done. Bruce Arian, the coach, is done. He's done. Now Larry Fitzgerald might That's quit. That's a good point. So, oh, and let's everyone – oh, just, just let the quarterback go. Everyone is always trying to destroy something that really, really works. And the mindset of Nick Foles, I believe, is more important in this because he has accepted that he's going to be a backup in Philadelphia. So they have a great situation to move forward. Nick. So here's here. Tell me if you agree with me on this. If Carson Wentz's injury were a different one, let's say it was a broken collarbone where you have you have no worry about him being ready for training camp, just suffers a broken collarbone, Full week healing, 13, and so, you know, right. man, we're not going to have him for the playoffs. But by now, by February, he's healthy. Then I think, do you agree the Eagles would be strongly shopping Nick Foles? See if they could get a first-round pick for Nick Foles, especially when you consider they do not have a second-round pick this year. They do not have a third-round pick this year. They have the 32nd pick of the draft and then do not draft again until the fourth round. If, if Wentz were going to be full go by minicamp, do you think Nick Foles would be on the trade market? No. Really? No, I wouldn't. How come? Because I, I wouldn't trade him because you put yourself still in the same position that you were in last year. And there's not that many good backup quarterbacks that you know you can get, especially that's a good price. You have to realize how much money are they spending for the quarterback position? Carson Wentz is in his first deal. Making like $6 million, yep. The backup's making six. You got $12 million. There's no one in football I think has a better quarterback situation than you at that price. You got two proven guys for twelve million dollars. The the reason that because I think people would be looking at what can we get for Nick Foles. Obviously, we have a Super Bowl caliber roster. The one of the reasons that I'm whether even if CC's right or wrong, one of the reasons that is not happening right now is they don't know when Carson Wentz is going to be back. It wasn't just a torn ACL. It's a torn ACL. It's a torn LCL, and it's a broken leg. So the idea that Carson Wentz is definitely going to be healthy for training camp, much or even definitely healthy for the start of the season, those are not foregone conclusions. Will, will Nick Foles' stock ever be higher than it is right now? Say he comes into this season as a backup, and he plays a couple seasons and Carson Wentz does come back. Can they get more for him at any point than they can right now, and do they factor that no. in? No. If Nick, his personal value is different than what his value is for the team. Okay. Like what he could be. If Carson Wentz does not play next year and he goes into free agency 2019. If Nick Foles doesn't Nick Foles, play next Foles. year. Yeah. If Nick Foles does not play next year, he will be more valuable on the free as a free agent after sitting out the whole season. Last time people saw him would be in this six-game window with Philadelphia. He that At that point, he would be very marketable for, for, for other teams. Now, from Philadelphia's concern, I don't know why you think they need another draft pick that you still would have to go out and get another backup. And that draft pick is not as worth as much as Nick, Nick Foles. Foles is to that team. So I want to show people something, and it's one of your favorite things, one of these blind reveals. Now, because we're talking about Nick Foles, if you're guessing right now one of these people is Nick Foles, you're going to be correct. But throw it up there. So here's two quarterback careers with the Philadelphia Eagles. The records are about the same. The guy on the right, better yards per pass, better touchdown and interception ratio, and a better quarterback rating. Show America who those two people are, if you would, please. It's Carson Wentz's time with the Eagles and Nick Foles' time with the Eagles. And I say all that to say this. If you're not trading Nick Foles, Chris, then I'm guessing this you're going to find this to be absurd. But if a team like Cleveland, that has the first pick, the fourth pick, that has the Eagles' second-round pick this coming year, if they called Philadelphia and said, hey, don't you guys just want to keep it going with Nick Foles? He's your Super Bowl MVP. You have him under contract. This other guy's injured. You don't know when he's coming back. We will give you our entire draft bounty so we have our franchise quarterback. You can stick with Nick okay, Foles. For one, Do they even for listen one, that's to it? Not, for one, it's not going to happen. For one, Cleveland's made so many mistakes, and if they sign Nick Foles, Nick Foles. I, I said for Carson Wentz, not for Nick Foles. I said for Carson Wentz. If they, no. they, they If Philadelphia no. doesn't even listen to him. 
No. Phil, so, so there's, Nick Foles, by winning the Super Bowl MVP, by playing brilliantly in the conference championship game in the Super Bowl, he, he is back to exact position he was at the beginning of the year. The Philadelphia Eagles know they are a good football team. All right? They can win with different quarterbacks. But they're not going to have their franchise right now where they are to take Carson Wentz. For one, the fans would never tolerate that. All right? Like, they would never tolerate that. I think this just... I know you're going to think it was crazy. I know it, it's just, I mean, <laughs> let, let, like, let's just slow down. Philadelphia just won. Yeah. They've never won a championship, all right? They got themselves in position because of Carson Wentz. Howie Roseman has done a tremendous job. Those draft picks are not as valuable as Carson Wentz. Because Carson Wentz, he's the answer to if they could win two or three Super Bowls. Okay. Now, they've never won one. Okay. And they could go on a run. They got a great defensive line. They got a great offensive line. They got good young players. Let's not get carried away. They just barely won their first Super Bowl. Like, before we try to change this organization, and, and, and which we don't know what they would be, Carson Wentz would quit football. <laughs> we're we're going to get into I mean, And don't we think that the, We haven't even had to play yet. <laughs> don't we think the sample size is a little small right now? He played a great conference championship Foles. and a great no, he's Super played, Bowl. No, he's played enough football because he's been – no, let's not forget – 2012, yes. 2013. And then what about everything after that? He wasn't good enough for anyone to keep him as a starter. The, the, so here's somewhere. Nick Foles. This is why it's so interesting. Foles is unlike any backup quarterback we've that I've seen in that he had this amazing season in 2013. Yeah. Then he had the Jeff Fisher era, which seemingly almost ruined his career. And, everyone and then he had this amazing resurgence the last month of this, the last three weeks of real time. So he's not. It's not the typical backup quarterback story. Yes, the sample size Nick, of excellence is very Nick, small. Seven weeks ago, you told them their season Season's was over. over. Because and of him. Now, wait, 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 wait. Because wait, 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 yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Uh huh. And now you want the Eagles to go forward with those crazy fans with Nick Foles as a quarterback? A very wise man once taught me with new information, my no. opinion can change. My new no, but it's supposed is... to get better. <laughs> All right, we are going to talk much more about what the Eagles need and what they can plan for next year in a bit. But coming up, did Bill Belichick tarnish his legacy on Sunday just by losing next year? Did you sleep that last night? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. You, you can knock confused. it down. I, I was like, I, maybe he was changing the Moving on, new topic. As downright giddy as the Eagles were to return home yesterday, the Patriots were not. No real big parade, no ring fittings, no other things adults do when they're really happy. We watched Tom Brady shine, throwing for over 500 yards on Sunday, but their defense gave up 500. 38 yards, they gave up 41 points, and now Brady will be 41 in the 2018 season, and he and Belichick have suffered their third loss in the Super Bowl. CC, did the Patriots losing have any impact on Brady and Belichick's legacies? Of course. Of course. Anytime you have an opportunity to, to tie the NFL record, I mean, they could get six Lombardi trophies. Right. All right? I mean, they're into collecting trophies now. They're not into the individual stuff, but collecting those team honors, yes. And, and talking to Mr. Kraft and traveling with them, that's their number one goal Winning. is to win championships. Tom Brady, why else would he be playing? But to win championships. Last year, he made it very, very clear. Fifth Super Bowl victory with two losses. But, man, I'm going to tell you, six and two looks a hell of a lot better than five and three. And now let's say if they go back one more time. Let's say they go back one more time and they lose. Now we five and four. So now they're starting to come back to the field compared to being five and two, six and two. Seven and two. I thought Brady would win seven championships. Right. As of Friday, you you would have thought seven and two. You, Chris Carter, a lot more likely than five and four. Yes. Right. Like I mean, that's where you were at. And then now, looking where teams are, there's more teams in the AFC that can beat New England. New England does. They got a lot of problems. Their offensive line, their defensive right. line. They don't have a pass rusher. Well, they do have a pass rusher. But he's going to he, be 40. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's older than Nick. <laughs> uh, a lot. I mean, he could like be, he can be Nick's, uh, you know, yeah. uncle. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of it. I mean, it's just they have some legitimate issues that they have to get fixed. Gronk, is he going to play football? Now, was there really a rift between Belichick and Brady? Because they say, you know, when you win, it makes things go away. 
Oh, they didn't win, though. And I do, He, this team will be affected by losing Matt Patricia sure. and the Josh McDaniels. So on the legacies, though, specifically, as a, like not just not looking to the future, but for the right now, I want to talk about Brady first because I, I want to be very fair here. I find five and three, obviously, not as impressive as six and two, but I find five and three more impressive than five and two. Why is that? Because I think getting to the Super Bowl is an Such accomplishment. I think that it, it, they would be 5-2 and two had they lost to the Jaguars. So I'm not going to ding them for beating the Jaguars and then losing in the Super Bowl. This is an argument I make about LeBron a lot. I will use it for Brady as well. If you look at pro sports with the Olympic model, where you have medals for first, second, and third, five golds and two silvers, it's not as good as six golds and two silvers, but it's also five golds and three silvers is better. So, like, I, I do think, I don't think the legacy is enhanced by the loss, but I think the legacy for Brady is enhanced by getting there. Now, what hurts Brady is, the you can't say the primary reason they lost is his fumble, but without his fumble, they likely win. Does that make sense? Like, they were in position to be able to get to six and two. He, after playing a brilliant game, made the critical mistake. But I think the guy that has a tougher legacy moment is the coach. It's the coach's defense. He is a defensive coach that let Nick Foles. But when the, they were winning championships with defense, we gave everybody credit. They we, won the first two. They won the first two mm -hmm. without Tom Brady being spectacular. Mm -hmm. But we gave him credit for the two. So now the defense not spectacular. <laughs> so you, you're not going to get him credit. You're going to cut him out of the equation where they were a defense and special teams dominated team for the first, more than first half of his career. Maybe in the moment we weren't giving Belichick enough credit, but when we were talking about, when we call Belichick the greatest coach ever, it's those first few championships are a big part of that. We give Belichick an enormous amount of credit, I think, for the <clears throat> width and breadth of his career. But the way this specific game went down, the defense not being able to get a single stop, some of the decisions that made during the game uh, at the end of the first half and the Malcolm Butler situation. And the more information that comes out on that, this, this one does not, this, getting to this game helps Bill Belichick. But the way Bill Belichick and the defense performed in this game, to me, does not enhance his legacy. All right, we're going to definitely talk about M Malcolm Butler coming up. But if we just stick to the legacy part mm -hmm. of it, if they don't win another Super Bowl, if they don't get to another Super Bowl, do, do Brady and Belichick cement themselves as, as the greatest coach-quarterback combo of all time, in your opinion? Uh, yes, but people are closer to them now. The more, that they, the more that the losses equal the wins, the closer they are, people are to them. So uh, let's look at a couple uh, situations. Now, Jim Kelly, mm -hmm. how many Super Bowls did he go to? Four. Four. All right. Fran Tarkenton, how many did he go to? Was it three? Okay. I'm um, not certain on Tarkenton. What about John Elway? John Elway went to five. Oh, okay. But how did he go to them? He let, I mean, he was the driving force for the first three, and okay, they lost. Okay, what about them. the team success early? The what, first three. The first three. Was, well, it was, it, he was the guy. Yeah, and, no, no, no. And, and he they was lost. the guy. Right, and they lost. Absolutely. And then what happened at the end? They got Terrell Davis and a few other guys, and they are guys think they and ended he, up winning. And he won two. Yes. Didn't that change his legacy? Of course. Don't we look at John Elway? And it's the order for which you win. Like, if you win them all, and then you start losing, you start coming back down. It's totally different than if they would have lost two or three, and then they ran off five of them. Well, it's why the Seattle win was so important. Because yes. they hadn't won a Super Bowl since yeah. 04. They had lost in 07. They had lost in 11. And if they had lost to Seattle, it's like, well, what the hell happened? Well, it's a decade plus of you guys being great but not getting there. But let me ask you this, because you, you, you mentioned as the losses mount up. I want to, Do you agree with me? And because most people don't, by the way, that five and three is more impressive than five and two. That that, do, or do you think their legacy would have been enhanced, knowing what we know now, had they lost to the Jags? I mean, they wouldn't have a Super Bowl loss. I would much not, so much not, he, not have the Super Bowl yeah. loss. Wow! It's just like Magic Johnson. He's five and, and four. four. He will never be considered the best basketball player, and a lot of that is just not based on skill. You know, if LeBron was five and four, we would have a better argument with him over Jordan than we would with Magic because he's a better player sure. than Magic. But with him losing in the finals, 
you in his, in his, having a losing record in the finals, it's hard to mount that that conversation. I, I understand the argument, and most people believe it. I just I this is where I've been a man on an island my whole life thinking about this stuff. That a loss in the championship round hurts you, but it doesn't do the other side of the equation, which is getting to the championship it's round. It's so should hard help you. in football, it's, and I agree with you. It is such okay, an incredible feat. Mm -hmm. The last thing Brady. Down 28 to 3. Mm -hmm. If we had never seen him ever play again. So don't tell me seeing him play in the Super Bowl enhanced his legacy. You mean, oh, if, he, if they don't back come back from that? If they don't come they back from the 28 If you never see him in the Super Bowl again, your last in his pressures That's is what he point. did to Atlanta in overtime. All right? Oh. Don't, you can't tell me that wasn't tarnished by losing to Minneapolis to the Philadelphia Eagles, who also had a backup quarterback. Switch gears for a beat here. The Eagles returned home yesterday to a bleary-eyed Philadelphia, a city which had yet to go to bed after Sunday's win. Philly has already announced all schools are closed Thursday for the big parade because students are fans too. What happened on Monday? Winning your <laughs> first Super Bowl in franchise history is pretty great. Beating the Patriots in the process, that's even greater. Here's head coach Doug Peterson on the monumental win. It's just a little more special uh, waking up today uh, knowing that you've um, accomplish something that you set out way back in in April um, and really when when I was hired two years ago when Mr. Lurie uh, um, you know hired me in Philadelphia that this is the game that, that we wanted to uh, eventually be in and play in and, and, and win and um, I know it's going to take some time but but uh, you know it's it's kind of surreal right now um, these next these next few days are going to be a little crazy we got a lot to do still but um, just excited for the guys, and, and uh, we'll remember this uh, the rest of our lives. So I know it's early, and I know they just won, and I know the dust has barely settled. But when you look at this Eagles team, CeCe, th they don't have glaring holes in their roster. They don't have huge positions where we looked at them this season and said, well, they have to address that. Or they, if anything, maybe it's the quarterback position, and that they seem mm -hmm. to have too many people in that position. So are the Eagles at this point set up for a, a long, strong string of success moving yeah. forward? Well, they have they – have Three major things, four things that, that you really establish in a good franchise. They have a great stadium deal. They make a lot of money. Not only the product on the field, but they make a lot of They're one of the highest earning revenue teams in the league. They have a great owner who is rich, absent of the National Football League. So his ability to put resources into the team, you can see that in their practice facilities. They have a good to potentially great young head coach. They have a franchise quarterback. And now they have this thing around the team that they've never had before, championship pedigree. So now, even if they're trying to, if they need a defensive end, which they hate last year, Chris Long deciding to take less money, go there, you're able to get players to fill in your roster because you got a franchise quarterback. The team is financially Cash flow positive. You're in the NFC each was one of the major, major divisions to be in. You play Dallas, Washington, New York. Man, you got a lot of good stuff going for you. But the number one thing is you have a franchise quarterback. And guys believe that Carson Wentz is going to be a star in the NFL. So you guys will buy in to that. So, yes, they are set up for long-term success. And ahead, you mentioned the head coach, but I want to zoom in on that for a moment. A head coach that, to me, did what he did in this playoff run with a backup quarterback was wildly impressive. Mm -hmm. Like, the play calling, because, and why am I giving the head coach credit? He and Frank Reich, the offensive coordinator. But those guys letting the reins loose entirely and call, having allowing Nick Foles to use the full game plan, which allowed them to blow out Minnesota, and then allowed them to hang 40 on the Patriots when they needed every last one of them. And so then you look at, the thing is with the NFL year to year, you look at roster turnover. Their entire offensive line under contract for next year. Their entire defensive line, their starters under contract for next year. The most expensive player on this year's team that is a pending free agent is Darren Sproles. He didn't even play. Now, listen, free safety Corey Graham, Patrick Robinson, a cheap corner they got in mm -hmm. on a one-year prove-it deal. Those guys are free agents. Those they, they might lose some guys, and they don't have cap space. But you know what they do have? 
They got Jason Peters yes. coming back. They obviously Carson Wentz coming back. Probably at a lower price. Jason right. Peters coming back at a lower price. And so they they don't have a lot of cap space to improve the team via free agency. But there, what did we say about this team? Great offensive line, yeah. great defensive line. Those two units are all back next year if they want. Back here on first things first. Rob Gronkowski had nine catches for 116 yards and two touchdowns on Sunday. But after the game, he said he would, quote, need to sit down and reevaluate things. That'll happen when your body feels like it just got run over by an 18-wheeler carrying anvils. <laughs> when asked, Bill Belichick said everybody goes through somewhat of a process at the end of the season. CeCe, how, how difficult is the decision that Gronk is facing right now, given the way his body feels and where his head is and obviously how the Patriots did in that last game? Okay, the number one thing is we, there's no way that we would know how he feels, all right, because some of the injuries, even if you did like an injury chart to the things that have been injured, there are a lot of guys that have injuries. You play this game, you're going to get hurt. But he said – multiple injuries in certain areas. So for me, I would be I would start to worry about how much arthritis and how I'm going to be 20 years from now. Cuz regardless of where he is right now, like he's seen other football players and it's easier now for the players because we have so much of a history of data and that that we know that football can be damaging to your body. Um, I think the way that he plays, that he wasn't going to have a 15-year career anyway. There's no way you can play at that size and play the way he plays and continue that for a long period of time. He's already one of the greatest tight ends that's ever played. Now it becomes a time, and I tell you guys all this, and sometimes it becomes very frustrating. There is no job from the NFL. Like, so when you're doing something and you're one of the elite of the elite, it's so easy for us to sit here and say, you know something? Guy's going to quit. Oh, this guy should quit. Well, what's he going to do next? Like, what's he going to do the rest of his life? Say just normal life expectancy, 74, 76. What does he do from now until then? Because it's hard to walk away from a great job, and I believe the National Football League being a player and being a star player is one of the best jobs or best careers ever. Here's what I want to ask you. When you retired from the Vikings, was that the first year that after the season you seriously contemplated it? No. So that's so that's what I want to know. So like, so you the how how long did it take from the first time you thought about it? It took several years. Okay. Because this is the first time I feel like it's on the board for Gronkowski. And so I the people can argue about whether or not Gronkowski is a Hall of Famer. I but he is an all-time great at his position. So the, to talk to another all-time great at the position to figure out, okay, from the time you first contemplated to when you actually pull the trigger, it's not always that offseason. Right. Do you think most players that are veterans that have accomplished a lot at the end of a year have the discussion within themselves, do I want to come back? No, this is what we do. This is part of our unwinding, our just downloading from the season. You are kind of in a bubble during the season. And you put your body through so much that after the season, we all tell ourselves, coaches, players, everyone in the organization, let's take some time off. Let it breathe. And then you make decisions as far as, okay, going forward, not that I'm going to retire, but what am I going to do to get better? What type of new things are we going to do offensively, defensively? So everyone in this business that's what we all do. So that's very, very normal. I think that when you said, and I agree with you, 99.9% .9 of the time, most people that leave football don't have something else set up that's, that's substantial or that could actually pay even close to what they're paying. I think for someone like Rob Gronkowski, though, he's so marketable and he's dipped his hand in so many different uh, jars, if you will, and he's so recognizable, whether it is his wrestling or writing a book or he's done a number of cameos. Like There are other little things where he doesn't, you know, he doesn't absolutely have to come back and play football for a lifestyle. But I will ask you this. Does Rob Gronkowski need football? I mean, some players just actually need it like it's like it's oxygen, like it's part of woven into their DNA, if you will. Um, that part right there is, is people, they, they don't know what it does for that person. Um, to me, every time I've seen Rob Gronkowski and everything that I've heard, Patriots players that say they've been with Rob Gronkowski say he's never had a bad day. 
He's very jovial. Happy he loves him. being around football. He loves football. Football, I'm sure, has given him a certain sense of identity to what he could do. There's not a lot of jobs that you would have known, Gronk, unless he was playing in the league. So a lot of times people just like, oh, I believe he can write a book. I am not interested in reading no book by Gronk. I believe that Gronk could wrestle. I'm not interested in seeing Gronk as a wrestler. There is no stage like the National Football League. Okay, so you wouldn't know him without his ability that was shown on the stage of the NFL. Well, here's, here's the thing that I think is, to Jenna's point, he is better set up than most any player that's not a quarterback to at least have entry points, to use a phrase you like, in a lot of different avenues, whether it be acting, whether it be wrestling, wh whether it be reality television, whatever it is. But what we have seen is there are a lot of guys who get those entry points. A lot of guys who look like, oh, they're set up perfectly for it. Some of them turn into our friend Chris Carter, our friend Michael Strahan, and they end up having great post-career careers. Some of them turn into Tiki. Like Tiki Barber, no distract to Tiki Barber. Everyone would have said, he's set up better than anybody. He's going to go do this, go do that. And it didn't. Uh, the highest profile he ever had was playing for the New York Giants. And, again, I'm not trying to disrespect the man, but that's the, that's the reality of how that played out. So I don't know. I do think Gronk is in a better position than Antonio Gates, you know, another great tight end for a post-career career. The question to me is, and it's what CC alluded to early on, and nobody knows this but Gronk, is what the hell does he feel like in the morning? This is, this how is, much pain is he in? Yeah, good. He, he's a football player. That's the way he's supposed to feel. That's the way all of us feel. Also, I don't think we understand what joy you get from playing the game. There's no joy in being no wrestler if you're a football player. Like, th th there's, not, like there's, there's, not the, there's not the equal trade-off. No, but the trade is not having to, maybe not wrestling, but with some of the other things, the trade is you, you're, not, you're not putting your body through the pain and you're still staying on somewhat of a very visible stage. I think that's the trade-off. Don't you go through so much pain during the season? Is that... Uh, yeah, it's, it's called football. Correct. But, it's, it's, it's part of the, you go through a lot of pain. You're training for what? For nothing. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Rob, he's being paid out. Look at his family. Like, look at all the things around Gronk that he has because of football. It's not because, oh, we like how he talks. Oh, we like how he looks. It's not like he's dropping dimes of wisdom on us. Right. All right? We love Gronk because Gronk played football good. All right? <laughs> The, like, let's not get that mixed and, up. And the money <laughs> side of it, if people are interested, Gronk, they, they might be surprised. He hasn't made probably as much as people thought. He's made a lot by regular people's standards, but for a guy who's been great at his, but he's made $45 million, but all in in his career. He's got 8 to $10 million on the board for next season. That's a sizable percentage of what his career earnings would be, and certainly more than he can make in any of the other fields put together. Right. Is there a wrestler out there making $10 million right now? The, just through wrestling, yeah. I would imagine John Cena through the acting makes close, but probably not. Oh, okay. I mean, The Rock parlayed it, but I mean, that's. We'll I don't watch think you for the lot. Patriots next year, bro. Uh, so, coming up. Yeah, could, write a book, man. I want to read that. Could, uh, Olivia would read that book. Could Malcolm Butler. You better put some pictures in there. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Could Malcolm Butler have made the difference in the Super Bowl? First things first, more next. Good stuff. All right, let's move on to the players who didn't play in the Super Bowl. Malcolm Butler, hero of Super Bowl 49, opposite of hero in Super Bowl 52. After the game, Butler, who was benched but for one special teams play, said they gave up on me. Now reports are this decision has left the Patriots' locker room divided. Yesterday, Belichick said, quote, I respect Malcolm's competitiveness, and I'm sure that he felt like he could have helped. I'm sure other players felt the same way. All right, let's dive in here. CC, could the Patriots have won if Butler played, or is that too simple uh, an analogy to make? No, he was a healthy scratch. He's one of the best football players on the field. I, I could argue that he was the best corner in the stadium. All right now, you might say Stephon Gilmore on his team, you know, because he came on later on and, and, and really had a good season after a very, very poor and shaky start. But Malcolm Butler on that field was the best corner on both teams, had the most experience on, of all the corners on the field, our secondary players, and yes, and it put his defense in a, in, 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 in a bind. It made Chung, Patrick Chung, the safety, have to play more man-to-man -man on Nelson Aguilar and some other players. He didn't have a good game. It, it made um, Rowe, who was the nickelback or dimeback, have to start 
It made him have a bad game because they started targeting him. So, of course, the Patriots, good players, win games. The Patriots had one of their best players in their secondary, one of the best players on their defense, one of the few players that has the experience with Bill Belichick, and they decided not to play him in the game. Of course they had a better well, chance to win the game. And that doesn't even speak to the emotional effect on the other guys that did play finding out the moment before the game starts, one of our best players, one of our, I know he's young, but a guy who's played in three Super Bowls, one of our emotional guys, a clearly well-liked player given the Instagram outpouring of current and former teammates, that he's not playing. Yeah, and we, we this is what we give New England credit for. So make sure we give them the blame for this. Yeah. They are the best at situational football of any team that we've ever seen. Any, they know how to win games better than any other team. They lost this game before it started when Belichick decides to not tell the guys. Because I know Belichick knew before the game. There's no way he didn't know. He don't listen to the national anthem, America the Beautiful, in, in reverse order, and then decide, you know something? My best is a secondary member. I'm going to sit him for the game. Whatever happened, he knew about it. When he decided to make that decision, he should have been able to convey that to the defensive leaders so these other guys who don't have the the... the don't have the experience so they can prepare. If I'm not a starter and you tell me before the biggest game of my life, five minutes, that I'm starting now, so I didn't even have the preparation time to know, okay, I might have to hydrate myself because i got to play more plays. You hydrate yourself. So did yourself. Belichick lose this game for these guys? Did Belichick lose the game? He benched, he benched Malcolm Butler. He did not help them win. I'm not going to say he lost the game, but he did not help them win by making this decision right before kickoff. I'm not trying to say that Malcolm Butler should have played because I don't know what he's setting down for. Obviously, something happened. All right? That's the part we have to make sure something happened. Now, based on not knowing that, I can't say he should have been out there. But the decision and how it was made affected the Patriots. All right, so some numbers here. So in the playoffs, Malcolm Butler had struggled enormously, right? Of every corner in the postseason, it was targeted at least 10 times, Malcolm Butler had given up the mo the highest passer rating, right? So we know that in those two playoff games that of which he played 100% of yeah. the snaps, he had struggled. But, but in the two practices leading up to the Super Bowl, he practiced as a starter. And the, the other part of the numbers has to be, okay, so when you took him out, were you getting a better performance? The guy who came in for him, Eric Rowe, was targeted seven times in this football game. Four catches, 80 yards, a touchdown, a 137 quarterback rating. Jonathan Batamosi, who is a special teamer, he only plays if there's an injury. He ended up being targeted on one play, a critical third down, where he missed, where he didn't break the pass up and he missed a tackle. Mm -hmm. It went for 17 yards. So the, the idea that Malcolm Butler, even if they're, and this is where I, CC is saying, no matter, you know, we don't know what happened. I know something happened. But, but here's my thing. You just don't know I what don't, it is? I don't, no, no, yeah, there's something had to have happened, but right. we don't know what it is. I, at this point, almost don't care what it was. Because here's why. No, no, no. Uh -uh. I care what it was. So do I. What, well, hold, let me, let me explain why, though. If it was, if it was this, if it was a punishable offense like this, why did you dress him? If, if, he was, if he was a healthy scratch, then absolutely, I will listen. Did he get caught, with, did he get caught doing something he wasn't supposed to do before the game? Was there, was there something? Did he shove a coach in the locker room? Was it, okay, fine. I will listen to that. But if, the moment you decide whatever he did, it, he is still worthy of one of our four, 46 game day activations, then you've got to, during the game, realize we got to put him in the game. What in what world is the penalty supposed to be? You're going to take one of our roster spots and throw it away. Because if, if he was being demoted, being demoted from being a starter is being the nickel or the dime right. player. Right. And then not playing more special teams. Like, you're just not starting. But 
you're not only just affecting him, you're affecting the whole roster. If you're saying he practiced with the first team yes. on the last two days of practice, that was when? Wednesday, Thursday? Thursday, Friday? Thursday, Friday. Yeah, all two weeks. So so do we assume this happened sometime on Saturday, which uh, would have uh, given the, the guys that stepped up behind him enough time to at least consider what they would have to change to um, I'm not going to I'm not going to assume when it happened. I'm not going to speculate. I'm just going to go with the things that I do know. He was in the starting lineup when they had the two weeks of preparation. So Bill Belichick, whatever happened, he didn't give the other guys the opportunity that they would get the starter reps. Because, and but here's the other thing: even if it happened the night before the game, unless we think it happened when they were taking the field, like the night before, you could tell Eric Rowe morning up, not minutes before. Like there is, this is you cannot make this type of drastic decision as a head coach have it go this poorly and not have us question what the hell just happened here like yeah. I mean it's totally I mean, fair to, to me it affected the game because it affected Absolutely. the psyche of the secondary you know they started the season bad communications from a secondary they end the season Super Bowl 52 with a loss because bad communication Bill Belichick you have to be able to communicate this to your leaders and to the guys who rolls change in the game. If he had strained his hamstring in warm-ups, that would be a legitimate excuse. But also the player, the player knows too, man, he's hurt. That's the reason why I'm out there. When you have a guy who is mentoring Roe, he's crying on the sideline. Roe would be going to him for help during the game. You studied this receiver. What do they run in this? All these situations. You don't have that natural feedback. Right. Carson Wentz, the, the role that he played in helping Nick Foles. You know the reason why? Because Nick Foles knows the only reason why he's in there is because Carson Wentz is hurt. Yeah. You hurt the secondary. You hurt the communication. And Brandon Browner went on the social media, and he said, I know because this is a close group. I've been in that group. And when you do something like this, it hurts the group. I take him on that. Moving on to the NFL, former Vikings head coach Mike Tice is reportedly stepping away from the game. After 35 years, Tice, who most recently served as the offensive line coach for the Raiders, says players no longer want to be coached. CC Tice was, uh, was your coach with the Vikings. What was your reaction to this? He was also one of my teammates. So I played with Tice. He's also been a coach on the staff. And when Dennis Green um, was let go, he took over as an interim. So me and Tice, he go way back. Him and his family is a very good coach. This is, if you talk to coaches around the league, yes, this generation of players, they are a little bit different. And Mike Tice is an old school throwback. When he was a quarterback at Maryland at 6'7", ended up going to have an 15-year, 16-year NFL career as a tight end, a blocking tight end, too. Tice can't run at all. But <laughs> he's right. He's an old-school coach. People don't like the in-your-face and constant getting on you. This generation of athletes is a little bit different. So there's a lot of truth to what Tice is saying. Sounds a little old man yelling at a cloudish, but I know, you, you, listen, this is a guy you actually know, so I'll defer to you on that. I don't – I do believe, though – it is, and listen, if he wants to get out of coaching, that's totally his prerogative. But it is the coach's job to evolve to the players, not the player, like that generation of players. It's one of the things that, for example, in college, Coach K has done a really good job on. Other coaches have not. Like, you have to constantly evolve to the new generation of players. If you feel the new generation of players don't want to be coached, I guess your options are to either get out of coaching or adjust the way you're coaching because the generations of players aren't going to change. I think he's been very, very successful if you look at 35 years. Oh, no doubt. I'm just I'm saying, but if that's, if that's your feeling at the moment, then I think that's the right move for him. Finally, both Patriots coordinators will be moving on. Josh McDaniels reportedly will take the Colts head coaching job, despite rumors he was going to back out. And Matt Patricia is officially taking over the Detroit Lions. CeCe, how big of a deal is it that both Pats coordinators are leaving? It's a huge deal. It's Belichick's tree is running out of branches, too. <laughs> so when you look at New England's organization, it's not, I would say, as inviting to young or other coaches in the league because there's only certain coaches that have an existing relationship with Bill or have or can get over that trust factor. So now you're losing your number one guy on the defensive side of the ball, losing your number one guy on the offensive side of the ball. Of course it affects. Bill Belichick's going to have to coach harder this offseason than any offseason any, that, that, that I remember to be able to replace him because how many of the assistant coaches and members of the staff 
video people, this Patricia take, this Josh take, because they're going to take some people from New England. So this franchise, it will be, it, it will feel the effect of both of these guys leaving it. I remember uh, Coach Mangini telling us about when they were hiring a guy that it was for the lowest level job. And the head coach, all the coordinators, everyone was in the room grilling this person about it was, it was the young coach. I'll think of his name in a moment. But grilling uh, Dable. It was it was the, the, the guy at Alabama, Brian yes. Dable. It was they were hiring him for the lowest level job in the organization, and they are drilling him for hours and hours and hours because Belichick takes that coaching staff so seriously. So CeCe's point that it's not just the coordinators; it's the other people they've spent a lot of time and resources mm -hmm. on uh, cultivating that leaving matters. Now on the defensive side of the ball, they might have gotten better though. If they get Greg Schiano, if he is the replacement, like I think that could be an upgrade for them on the defensive side of the in, ball. In the NFL, it's not the X's and O's, bruh. It's the Willies and the Joes. They do not have great personnel. So to think Greg Schiano, Greg Schiano got better personnel at Ohio State. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, for Ohio State, he's got more oh, for options. for Ohio State, okay. He's sure. got three or four defensive backs that will be in the NFL. He's got four of his nine defensive linemen, I can guarantee you, will be first-round picks in the NFL. So um, when I say relative to college Re no and the options, yes. It's Now, is he closer to getting a head job by going back with Belichick because he had the Tennessee job? That's probably the best thing for him, but it's not a better job. He doesn't have better things that he can do that, with the personnel. My point is as far as talent of the coordinator. I don't think the drop from Patricia to Shiano exists. Like, no, I think, no, no. That's, a, that, that's, that's a great, my yeah, point. Yeah, I, I think they, I don't know who their offensive coordinator is going right. to be, but I don't think their coaching staff, I don't think they got worse at the coordinator position, the Patriots, from Patricia to Shiano. I think Shiano's a very good coach. Right. It's just like when I was with the Vikings. I mean, we had a great staff. When Dennis Green was the head coach, our defense coordinator was Tony Dungy. Yeah. Our offense coordinator was Brian Billett. Now, we lost Tony first. He took part of the staff with him. And then when Brian Billick left to go to Baltimore, he took part of the staff with him. That actually two years later, when Denny was fired, their only option was Mike, Mike Tice, Tice. Right. Because the other guys had gone other places. So, yes, there is a tremendous effect when you lose great people. Quickly, how coveted is, is the position to be a coordinator to work for someone like Bill Belichick? You in a hurry to get yelled at? <laughs> that's what I'm like saying. You in, a, you in a hurry to get yelled On at? On paper, it seems amazing. But I'm worried hey, that maybe that's it's a great little bit of what career. it is. Call Mangini. See if he wants, see if he wants to go back there. <laughs> but it is, but it is great for people's <laughs> careers. Almost all those coordinators have gotten head coaching opportunities. Not many have been successful. If you can deal with it, it's a great career upward mobility. Jenna, you, you want to eat a whole humble pie every day. Because that's what it is working with Bill Belichick. Belichick. I couldn't even get the question out. That's Do you hear me? The co <laughs> co coordinator. <laughs> all right, now that the 2017 <laughs> season is in the books, it is time to move on to 2018. That's how time works. Yep. After all, the start of next season is only 212 days away. The Super Bowl odds were released. Not surprisingly, the Patriots are the favorites at 5-1. to one. Eagles have the second best odds at 15-2, to two, even though they won the Super Bowl. Trailed by the Packers and Steelers at 10-1, to one, with the Vikings rounding out the top five at 12-1. to one. All right, Nick, is it too early to bet? with their mods and should the Patriots be Super Bowl favorites next season? It's never too early to place a wager. Let me tell you that much right <laughs> now. And if you bet on the Philadelphia Eagles the day, this day, one year ago, you got them at 55 to 1. So that, that was a team that was not on the first mm -hmm. page of the odd sheet that mm -hmm. ended up winning the Super Bowl. Now, people didn't see Carson Wentz doing what he did in the, the whole season. They were a long shot that ended up coming in. To answer the other question, should the Patriots be the favorites? They should be in that first group. I don't know that they should be number one. We just talked about the coaching issues. As far as, when I say coaching issues, the loss of yes. their D coordinator, their offensive coordinator, and then a bunch of people's names we don't know, but Chris can attest how important that is. We discussed earlier at least some uncertainty about the future of their most talented offensive player in Rob Gronkowski. I... I hate to – I know I was skeptical of a 40-year-old Tom Brady. He won the damn MVP, then threw for 500 yards in the Super Bowl. But they are going to be starting a 41-year-old quarterback <laughs> without their – what, you're laughing at me, but, like, it's a real thing. They are – so as far as them being the, the overwhelming favorites, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not laughing at you, but it's just – Man, you got to keep following it up. It's funny because we're like, man, we've never seen this. 
I remember the first show you said mm. this is like, we've never seen this. Like, <laughs> right. I'm not as, listen, I'm not as, as going but into But we the have year, proven something. We have proven. S someone can play great at 40. 40. He won the MVP. But the, and. It threw for 500 yards in the Super Bowl. 500 yards in the Super Bowl. It was not the, I mean, he was the reason they were in the football game. But when we're talking about, because I think you're going to agree with me, that the Patriots being the clear cut favorites doesn't quite to me, make full sense, especially no. when you consider we saw how many new players they need on defense. Like yes. seven? Oh. I mean, and one of their most talented ones, Malcolm yeah. Butler, is definitely walking out the door. Yes. So maybe I shouldn't have brought up the Brady part of it, but for all those other reasons, are they, do they have the best chance of winning the Super Bowl next year? Probably not. Yeah, I don't think the Patriots should be the favorite. Um, I think the Eagles should be the favorite because they won 13 games. Also, I look at the team's that won a lot, and that being the Vikings, the Eagles, and the Steelers. I believe that those three teams should be right there. I believe New England should be right in that grouping, but there's a couple other teams I believe are going to be really exciting. There's three teams, the Texans, the Saints, and the Rams. I believe all these teams with their younger players have made tremendous jumps then for 2019, they're going to be vying, you know, for the crown of that Lombardi trophy. So New England should be in the top three. Don't think they should be number one. I think the Eagles, who won with their backup, and they have an MVP candidate that will be healthy. We're familiar with the injury. People recover from it. I don't believe the Packers should be 10-1. to 1. Their roster's not that strong. I believe the Steelers, the Vikings are better than the Packers, and their, and their percentages um, should be higher to win the championship. And the three teams CC mentioned, Rams, Saints, Texans, are all 20-1. to 1. They're yes. in that next tier, mm -hmm. along with the Falcons and a team but that probably should shouldn't be up there. But this should only be Cowboys. about how many games a team won last year. Shouldn't this be which team is primed to, to not have too much turnover, to, to have the central core back next year as well? And don't the Eagles seem to have that more than any other team right, right. now? Well, all the teams that won 13 games have their nucleus came, coming back. That's the reason why I included them in the group all right it's not they had some outstanding season or don't need it's much like the rams like the, the rams yeah they had an outstanding season they made a big jump these other teams they have been at the top the rams made that jump with great young players so i think they will continue to ascend every team that i mentioned they have their nucleus and they have their core group of guys coming back one team that is not on this first page that it would be a similar eagles type wow they came out of nowhere season is Denver if they end up signing Kirk Cousins. Denver right now is 40 to 1. If they end up getting Kirk Cousins, they will drop probably to 25 or 20 to 1. That's a team that if you can squeeze one more year out of the defense is interesting when it gets a quarterback. Kansas City's at 27-1 with a young quarterback in his second year. It'll be in Pat Mahomes. Those are some other those are some other interesting ones. Now that the NBA season is heating up, I wanted to talk about another podcast we do at Fox Sports, and that's Chris Broussard's In the Zone. Each week, Chris breaks down what's trending in the NBA and the biggest names in the league. Previous guests include Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Shaq, John Wall, and myself. So if you love the NBA, make sure to subscribe to In the Zone wherever you get your podcasts. Moving on to the Cavs, who, despite us not talking about them for the last few days because of the Super Bowl, are still bad. They got blown out by the Rockets over the weekend. Sorry, Nick. They got blown out 120 to 88. In fact, it got so bad, LeBron James suggested they should, quote, be taken off national TV games for the rest of the season. Okay, drama classes are on Saturdays, LeBron. Once considered a contender to win the title, Coach Ty Lue was asked if this team will even still make the playoffs. We're still going to make the playoffs. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, we feel confident in that, for sure. All right, Nick. Uh-huh. There's this, there's this thing called rock bottom. Uh -huh. I don't know if the Cavs are close, but they have to at least be able to see rock bottom within what their sights. What are you sights. doing, CeCe? What do you, what do you got uh, going let on? Let me straighten up your paper because you need to get your thoughts uh -huh. together. Uh-huh. No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I don't, need, any, me because, I don't need any paper for this. Because we all know. No, get your thoughts the, together. There were a lot of opportunities for this team to hit rock bottom. The 148 they gave up oh. when they lost to the second team for the San Antonio Spurs. Uh. Then we said they hit rock bottom when they lost to the Pistons. After the Pistons had traded away their second best player, they hadn't even gotten Blake Griffin yet. Mm. And then they played a game against Houston, a Houston team, by the way, that earlier this year, when the Cavs were go what kind of turned around the beginning of their season, actually. Remember, they started 5 of 7, and then they won 18 of 19. The loss mixed in there 
or right before that, was a game in Houston that was played down to the wire, and it seemed like, oh, the Cavs, they have figured something out. Instead, they get absolutely obliterated. Chris Paul dominates the game from start to finish, and it, fi it felt like rock bottom. It felt like LeBron being as checked out over a prolonged stretch as I've seen him in his career. It, it confirmed for anyone that thought, oh, everything will be fixed once January ends. LeBron said the days don't matter, like, and he was right because this game was in February. So is this rock bottom? I mean, until the next one, right? I mean, they play tonight against Orlando, an Orlando team that I think has 16 wins on the year. They lose by 30 to them. That'll be the new rock bottom. I, I agree with Ty Lue. They're going to make the playoffs. But the way they have played since January 1st, if they were to continue playing like that, they would play themselves out of the playoffs. CC? Wow. Um, have they hit rock bottom? Well, I'm just going to tell you, don't build a house where they are right now. <laughs> okay? Because I just believe there will be <laughs> monumental other things of depth which they will sink to. And this is going to get ugly, and this is not going to end well. This is all just tall tale signs of LeBron James leaving Cleveland for the second time. Now, this time won't be as bad because he did deliver a championship. But Daniel Gilbert and all the signs that people will start to understand, wow, I could see why LeBron is not going to opt into a finishing contract with the Cavaliers. No, this is going to get worse. All right? Kevin Love is going to be out for an extended period of time. I still don't believe, even with the trade, that they're going to be an elite team because Kevin Love's not going to be back yet. So even if they add another player or two, it's just a matter of scrambling around. until I believe LeBron's going to leave. And I believe all these signs tell us that he's going to leave. But we just don't want to obviously look at them. They're not even championship level right now from a competitive standpoint. Right. It's going to be interesting the next three days. I mean, they, they got a back-to-back. -back. They played night, mm -hmm. and they played tomorrow night. So it, watch. And don't build a house right here, Jenna. When we get to the end of the week, watch the kind of stories and the headlines we're going to have. Because I was looking in Cleveland, but now that you said that, I probably will look elsewhere. So that's interesting what you said, that you don't think even adding a couple players will do much at this point. So you you do believe that there's something they can do, or maybe yeah, you don't, but is there something no, that would I, listen, happen the, the, at the deadline that, that will change your perception of the team, where they're going, the direction, anything? I still believe the Cavs are going to play in the NBA Finals. As they play right now, they would have no shot to win those NBA Finals finals in order for them to have a shot to win those NBA finals and for CC to believe they can even get there I would imagine they need one of the following two or maybe both of the following two things to happen they need to make a major trade and they need Isaiah Thomas to start playing like an NBA player the Cavs since January since Isaiah Thomas came back have had the worst backcourt in the NBA, JR has struggled for a year and a half, and then Isaiah Thomas came in, and he's been worse than Jose Calderon. He's been worse than Derrick Rose, who was terrible. Since Christmas, they have the third worst net rating in basketball. That's not just defense, that's offense and defense combined. They've been a bad team. Go ahead, Jenna. Susan. I got the trade for the Cavs. Tell me. You say Dan Gilbert is running the team now, mm -hmm. he wants to. Yeah. Be the puppet mouse. Jeez. Jerry Jones-ish. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what he said. He wants to be the NBA's Jerry Jones. This clown. Okay. When's the trade deadline? February. Two days from today. Okay. I go to LeBron tomorrow to ask him, is he going to be in Cleveland? You're Dan Gilbert. I'm Dan Gilbert. All right. LeBron tells me, no, um, I can't give you that answer. I say, then, no problem, LeBron. I need you to, to waive to, your no trade. I need you to waive your no trade, and I'm getting ready to trade you. I would trade LeBron James 24 hours before the trade deadline. If he doesn't opt into the contract, I'm going to trade him. I'm going to take the phone and say, anybody want LeBron James? Give me your best offer wow. because that would leave the franchise in better shape in March than it's going to be now in June. CC. Uh, so I don't think LeBron would waive his no trade, but let's assume he would. Let's assume he would say, you know what, I'll give you a list of teams that I would be fine going to for the end of the year. I know you you dismissed my the Carson Wentz potential trade. I will not dismiss this. 
I find that interesting. I no, think because it's I'm not logical. messing around like you. I the, don't come up with some the, old pie in the well, sky. Well, let me well, try this to. Is, this let is me a little, try to. There's a me, little pie in the sky because LeBron James, the idea that he's going to waive is no trade. I, no, no. If I own the team, it's mm-hmm. a legitimate option that people have not discussed. Well, it, they haven't discussed it because LeBron has to consent to it. The reason they haven't discussed That's it is conversation, because. That's a conversation, though. It, it, and if I own the team, mm-hmm. I got the I, I, I got okay, the power so, to be able to do that. Say he yeah. chose. He could choose a couple teams. Oh, I mean, you you would choose Houston. He would choose San Antonio. San Antonio. San Antonio. Uh, the weird thing, though, and the reason I said Houston, but I hesitated a bit, would he want to go to a team if he did waive his no trade? A team that he could sign to in the offseason that they wouldn't have to give up anything for. Like, weaken them for the years to come. Or would he just like, here's the most interesting one. What about Milwaukee? Hey, Milwaukee, I'll play for you for three months. You give up Chris Middleton. You, I've thought about this, by the way. You give up Chris Middleton. You give up Jabari Parker. Maybe Malcolm Brogdon. The salaries match up. Like I said, I've okay. thought about this one. Then all of a sudden, him, Giannis, Eric Bledsoe, the guy you want to play with before. Like, that's formidable. There, there are some options. Maybe, I mean, Kyrie probably wouldn't like it. Maybe Boston could make something happen. Like, there are some options. I don't think LeBron is going to allow himself to be traded. But that is, it is interesting. It's, I, I, I'm always for interesting, and it is interesting. More bad to come. I'm Jenna Wolf, and thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Make sure to subscribe and tell your friends, family, and coworkers about the podcast, which, by the way, is available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. You can catch a fresh new episode every Monday through Friday on FS1, starting at 6.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. Pacific. So long, everyone.